zero Georgian. It's so not good. Uh, we apologize that we are late. We're doing a lot of things at once here. My name is Stephen Kolkai, and um, probably uh, you've had a little bit of um, background um, about me, but I, I'm not, I don't know for sure, so let me just quickly give you some, and, and then also uh, my, my colleague Buzz, uh, Kenny, will do the same. Um, I uh, am a uh, business guy and an entrepreneur, um, 30 years of business experience. I'm from Los Angeles, California, um, and uh, I spent most of my uh, career doing a combination of working for um, in investment banking, originally management consulting, and then in the entertainment industry, and I was in the entertainment industry for a long time, spent 10 years at Warner Brothers, uh, ending up as the chief operating officer. And I also um, had several startups, and most of them were terrible failures, which is why I claim to be a really successful entrepreneur, because any entrepreneur who has not had failures is not a successful entrepreneur. Um, so I had mostly failures, but I had one big success, um, which was a television satellite company. It's called SCS. It's based in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Um, today, it's the largest commercial television satellite company in the world. It distributes all of the cable channels here from uh, BBC to CNN to MTV to HBO, Al Jazeera, 52 satellites, 6,200 channels of audio, video, and data, 10,000 employees worldwide. Um, I retired and sold my last company, which was not a successful company um, in Los Angeles, um, and I uh, retired and, and moved, and uh, uh, in, 19, in uh, 2009, uh, when President Obama was elected, um, he uh, gave his first major foreign policy speech at Cairo University. And in his speech, he talked about something which had been very important to me for a long time, which is the power of entrepreneurship and why entrepreneurship is so important in a variety of ways, including job creation. Um, and uh, uh, I ended up uh, joining the State Department and going to work for Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State. Um, and, and I started a program at the State Department called the Global Entrepreneurship Program, GEP, which still exists. And GEP's um, purpose uh, was to spur entrepreneurship specifically for, to create jobs, and specifically in Arab countries or Muslim countries. So for uh, most of the uh, first Obama administration, uh, most of the time that uh, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, um, I worked in eight countries, Egypt, Indonesia, Turkey, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. Um, and in all of these countries, um, I spent uh, my, my time um, developing a program to, to work with entrepreneurs and to spur entrepreneurship in these countries. And when I left um, the State Department just before Secretary Clinton finished her time as secretary, I uh, continued to do this work, which is working in developing countries now, not just Muslim countries, but all over the world. Um, to try and turbocharge entrepreneurship in these countries. So now I've worked in about two dozen countries um, all over the world. Natalia uh, Pipia, who uh, is the one who brought me here, was Georgian and a very proud Georgian and has been talking to me about Georgia for a long time, uh, asked me to come with her on this trip. She and I are working together on a World Bank project uh, to spur entrepreneurship in the Caribbean. We're working in eight countries in the Caribbean, uh, primarily mentoring incubators. So we're working with business incubators, techno parks, and the managers of those incubators to help them design programs that are specifically the most effective programs for entrepreneurs. And I assume most of you, if not all of you, are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs uh, or are involved in, in one way or another in the startup world. So the purpose of coming to Georgia 
was to um, assess the uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem here and to provide some um, recommendations, some suggestions to the Georgian government uh, about uh, how to turbocharge, how to increase and improve what I have to say is already one of the most impressive entrepreneurial ecosystems I have worked in in developing countries. So I've worked in a lot of places and, and I've you know, been here uh, about a week now and um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just you know blown away. I mean, I think this whole facility, um, a lot of the things I've seen, a lot of the people I've seen uh, are, are way ahead of uh, many of the other countries um, that I have worked in. But as is the case everywhere, including the United States, uh, there's always more. One can always do better. And that's certainly true in the US in a lot of ways. So uh, what, what I want to do is just briefly go through with you the presentation that we're essentially giving to the government um, tomorrow night to the prime minister, and up until now to everyone else leading up to that meeting. So you're the last people to see it before the prime minister does. Um, so you can tell me what to fix make it better so that when we go and talk to him, it's really good. Um, but the, the, the work that I do is, is, is based on um, a key, uh, a, a key uh, concept, which is what I call um, the, uh, the six plus six model of entrepreneurship um, uh, ecosystem building. And the six plus six model basically assumes that there's no one thing that you can do to spur entrepreneurship. There's a combination of things. And if you only do one thing, you're not going to succeed. But if you do a combination of things and you weave them together, then you're much more likely to succeed. So I call it the six plus six model because there are six categories of activity and six categories of participants that all need to be involved to actually make the ecosystem work. So the six categories of activity are the blue wedges of the pie, identify uh, entrepreneurs, train entrepreneurs, connect and sustain entrepreneurs, which is about mentorship, incubation. <laughs> Someone who you really so get excited about because they were successful. And, and a 
lot of countries like Georgia, you don't know about those people. They don't talk about them enough. They talk about Steve Jobs, they talk about Mark Zuckerberg, they talk about the Americans, but the fact is that they also exist here. They just are not talked about. And so celebrating entrepreneurs is great. So there are six, these six categories of activity. And then there are six categories of players uh, who need to be involved. Corporations, foundations, universities, NGOs, which are non-government organizations, uh, investors, and government. And I emphasize government uh, because uh, the fact of the matter is um, that while all six of these pillars are important, they really rest on uh, the, 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 the leadership of the government. I've done a lot of case studies of, of entrepreneurship in, around the world. I've looked at a lot of government and, and country programs, so I've looked at Israel and Singapore and Chile and Malaysia, Korea, um, and particularly Rwanda recently. And uh, the one thing you will find in common in every country, starting with the United States, is that um, if the government is not involved, if the government is not supportive of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, it's not going to happen. And when I work in different countries around the world, one of the first things I uh, say is that if you are not, uh, if you don't have the support of the government, both financially and from a regulatory standpoint, your chances of succeeding are very, very slim. In fact, in most places, including the United States and Israel, which are probably, Israel is probably the most successful uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem world on a per capita basis, more successful than the U.S., uh, the, 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 the wave of entrepreneurship was actually uh, led by the government. So the most significant initial funding came in a government-funded venture capital firm. Uh, the most significant private funding came in tax incentives that were provided to private investors up to $250,000 who invested in early stage companies, giving them huge tax benefits. And all of the major research institutes, whether they were in information technology, biotechnology, agribusiness, climate, energy, all of them, um, like in the United States, received huge amounts of government funding. The internet in the United States would never have existed if it were not for government funding, right? The internet started at the Defense Department. It started with 20 participants, 20 universities who were working on projects for the Defense Department, DARPA, many of you will know, um, and it was entirely funded by the government. And it was only much later that it became a private business. And the same is true with many, many innovations, Teflon, post in fact, even post-it stamps uh, and the adhesive that goes on the back of post-it stamps, these are all things. The first steam engine was funded uh, by the government. So that's why I'm trying to make the argument to the Georgian government that just like every other country in the world, you need to be uh, really putting your money where your mouth is if you want to spur uh, a startup uh, here. So the, the, um, the uh, six pillars are important, but the government is the most important of the six pillars. Now, um, I, I, I will come back to this, but um, when we uh, work with um, clients, so my clients are national governments, like the government of Turkey. Um, uh, maybe the government of Georgia, if they decide to hire us, um, but also uh, major donors. So for example, the World Bank is my biggest client. So right now we're working in the Caribbean in a program funded by the World Bank. And um, we have a three-step process uh, for how we work in a country. The first is a diagnostic. The 
The second is a design of the entrepreneurship program going forward. And the third is the implementation. So the analogy I use here is the, the kind of work I do, it's sort of like being a doctor for entrepreneurship. So a doctor, um, every human being on earth, Georgian, Chinese, Rwandan, American, is exactly the same, right? We all have the same biology, we all have the same anatomy, we all have the same physiology, we all get the same diseases. So when people go to medical school, whether it's in Georgia or California, they're learning exactly the same thing, right? Generally speaking, the treatments available are also universal. There are certain drugs, there are certain procedures that you can use for any disease. Having said that, no two people who have the same disease probably will be treated in exactly the same way, right? You know, I'm a fat, bald, middle-aged Jewish guy. This is a beautiful, young Georgian woman. Probably, if we both had exactly the same sickness, we would not be given the same medication. We would not be given the same treatment. The same is true in the work that I do. The basic elements of the entrepreneurial ecosystem are exactly the same everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're in California, or in Georgia, or in Egypt, or in Indonesia. They're all the same. And by the way, I've worked all over the world with entrepreneurs, and the other thing that's the same is entrepreneurs. The people who are entrepreneurs are the same people everywhere in the world. And even if they can't speak the same language, it's fascinating to me. They all get along with each other. Because all they're really interested in is building their own business. And therefore, each of them is not interested in the politics. They're not interested in the religion. They're not interested in the difference in age or sex or race. They're interested in, are you going to invest in my company? Are you going to be a customer for my product? Can you help me make a better product? They all have exactly the same questions. It's fascinating. So when you are doing the kind of work that I do, the, the first phase, the diagnosis, is the same everywhere. So I just finished a project um, for the UK government in Ghana, in Africa. And we spent three months doing a diagnostic of the, of the ecosystem there. And we found there are about 26 players in the Ghana ecosystem. There is a, uh, two or three great incubators. There are three or four co-working spaces. There are two terrific universities with entrepreneurship training programs. There's one angel investor group. Um, there's a couple of different prototyping labs that are available to prototype early stage products. So we looked at everything that was out there and we mapped it and we said, okay, here's how a patient is right now. This is how much the patient weighs. This is their blood pressure. This is what their pre-existing conditions are. This is what medications they're allergic to. We have a picture now of the patient. So what can we do to make the patient better? Well, we realized that there were several areas where there were weaknesses. And at this point, one of the things I, I want to say is that um, I, I believe very strongly that um, it's important to segment the kinds of startups there are. Because different treatments work for different kinds of startups. So first, the first segmentation is between tech and non-tech or sometimes I call it no-tech, low-tech, and high-tech. So no-tech is a whole bunch of cool businesses. Food products, like the incredible yogurt they have in Georgia, which I want to import to the US. Um, fashion, building material, consumer products, travel and leisure, sports, there are a whole bunch of non-tech categories of entrepreneurship. Low tech is, generally speaking, um, those businesses where there's some tech component, but they're not primarily about the technology. For example, eBay, right? eBay is about auctions. Auctions are not technical. Auctions have been happening for thousands of years, especially in a place like Georgia, which is 
where everybody in the world crosses the, through the middle of Georgia, right? So in, in places which, which so options are, are not new. The application of uh, technology uh, to, to auctions was new. And then high tech is new IP. So it's new intellectual property. And that's all of the things that we talk about, whether it's biotech, uh, you know, nanotech, cybersecurity, a whole range of new intellectual property. There's a very, very small percentage of startups, tiny percentage of startups, that are based on new technology. The vast majority of startups are in the no-tech and low-tech uh, The second thing is, um, in, in segmenting uh, the, the startup world, is I make a, a certain I have a definition of an entrepreneur, which is different than a small business. So for me, an entrepreneur, the definition of an entrepreneur, and I just finished a book, um, which is coming out in the summer, which, I, which you can all buy, which I would love, um, which is called World Peace for Entrepreneurship, uh, and it's coming out in the summer. It's on my website also. Um, so in, 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 in this book, I, 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 I make the, the point that, um, uh, there, there are um, uh, you know, different levels of, of uh, development of startups. Um, and um, you have to develop programs that are different for different levels. So not only is there a distinction between tech and non-tech, but there's also a distinction between the level of maturity of a startup. And so from that sort of matrix comes a, a, a list of programs, many of which this place is already starting to do, or at least it is planning to do. As you know, this is brand new. This, by the way, is a, just an incredible facility. I mean, there are 2,500 incubators in the United States, and I don't think I've seen one that is as impressive as this one, certainly that there has the same view as this. Uh, so you, you, are, you are really in a very exciting place at a very exciting time being in Georgia because I sort of see you at the hockey stick point of just about to take off, assuming that at least a few of you are going to be successful. But the distinction I make, uh, the definition I have of what an entrepreneur is someone who innovates a product or process and then has the ability to make it happen. And this distinction of product or process is really important. So let me give you an example. If you open a new restaurant, of which there seem to be many in this town, um, that's not necessarily entrepreneurial. That's a new restaurant. That's a new business. There are lots of restaurants. There will be lots more restaurants in the future. Some have good food, some have not so good food. But that's there's nothing innovative about that. It can be creative, it can be exciting, but it's not necessarily entrepreneurial, which is perfectly fine, by the way. On the other hand, if you change the process, that becomes entrepreneurial. So, for example, Starbucks did not invent coffee. For all I know, somebody in Georgia invented coffee. But Starbucks certainly didn't invent coffee. But what Starbucks did do is it changed the process for selling coffee. And it created, therefore, a new, uh, what I would call, truly 